Grow Native, and Wild One St. Louis. Scott serves on the planning committees for the Partners for Native Landscaping Conference and the Small Grants Program for the Deer Creek Watershed Alliance and MSD Project Clear. Not sure what he, when he has any spare time. Um, tonight's talk is entitled, Rainscaping Practices, Gardening with Purpose. I will now turn the webinar over to tonight's speaker, Mr. Scott Woodbury. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, it was really good talking to you today and catching up. And uh, I'm really excited about um, the New Jersey Pine Barrens. I wish I was there to join you for that. Um, when I was at Longwood Gardens, uh, I went to the Pine Barrens um, a number of times and I just really miss it. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and get this thing up here. And here we go. Just holler if uh, this isn't looking right on your end. Mm. Are we back on? We only see you, Scott. Okay, uh, let me just get this thing up. There you go. You got it now. There we go. Okay, so um, so we great. Um, so we also have uh, my native landscaping practices uh, class with us tonight. So thank you all for um, for being so uh, accommodating. Um, rainscaping is a subject that's really important in St. Louis, um, especially, but it's important across the country. Um, municipalities. Um, over 50,000 are required by law to pay attention to stormwater volume and velocity. And a lot of communities um, nationwide are really getting their act together. Um, some are being forced by lawsuits to get their act together. Others are doing it voluntarily. Um, St. Louis is um, somewhere in between. Um, and there's some really um, exciting projects and movement that's happening in our, in our area. Uh, rainscaping is really about a lot of different um, a lot of different practices, um, but rain gardening is probably the one practice that captures the greatest amount of, of stormwater. So we developed a rainscaping a rain gardening guide. Um, you can go to Shaw Nature Reserve's website and find the native landscaping manuals. Uh, chapters one through four. Chapter two is on rain, uh, rain gardening and stormwater management. Um, it's a resource that you can download. Um, it's available um, free or you can order paper copies, um, but it's something that'll help you um, understand what rain gardening is at a, at a deeper level. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is really going to be general and talking about rain gardening as well as um, many other different practices um, that are currently being used to, um, to deal with stormwater. Um, I'm going to back way up. I want to talk a little bit about what, um, what rainwater did before um, humans um, created all of these buildings and structures and sidewalks and roadways, um, and then talk about what it looks like today in terms of um, the hydrology of rain, rainwater and, and water flow. Clearly, this illustration at the top um, shows a landscape free of uh, impermeable surfaces. Um, you know, everything about the environment um, without concrete, without um, human structures, um, absorbs rainwater, encourages rainwater to, um, to evaporate back into the atmosphere, you know, as water falls on tree leaves, that happens. As water goes into the ground, they're following roots of plants deep into the ground and charging aquifers with water um, deeply. There's water flowing sideways underground um, and not a lot of water, if any water flowing above ground in a situation where there's no um, uh, permeable, uh, impermeable surfaces. of what happens with rainwater when it hits a building, when it hits a sidewalk, when it hits a road, 
all of these surfaces are impermeable. Water no longer is allowed to go into the ground. Um, and what happens is it runs over the ground. Okay, so probably not a surprise. Um, but uh, what we're what we're talking about are finding um, significant ways to encourage water to um, use pathways that that used to be prevalent uh, before we had all of the human infrastructure that we have now. Um, we are looking to do lots of different things, um, protect um, stream banks, the stream banks that we have, we need to protect them. Um, we need to, um, to encourage water to, um, to go into the soil by having more plants around us, whether they're trees or ground layer vegetation or herbaceous plants that are growing in rain gardens and bioretention gardens. Um, there are a number of ways that we can encourage water to move back into um, the soil column the way that it, it did once long ago. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about rain gardens. We're going to talk about um, replacing turf because the simple act of replacing turf is something that um, encourages rainwater to move into the soil column. We'll talk about planting trees, shrubs, um, and dealing with permeable surfaces. How do we turn permeable surfaces into, or how do we turn impermeable surfaces into permeable surfaces? I want to say that there's a really great tool. We've been talking about resources in this class, um, resources that be, can be helpful um, to, to do the, the practices that we um, are learning about in class. Um, a, another really great resource is the, um, the Rainscaping um, website at Missouri Botanical Garden. So if you go to the uh, Rainscaping page, there's this interactive um, um, interface where you can plug in um, information and into a filter, and the filter will tell you what rainscaping practices would be a good choice for you. Um, so I'm not going to go through that, um, that process. You can go and play with it and, um, and see how it looks. Uh, I would imagine that rainwater in St. Louis behaves in very much the same way that rainwater behaves in New Jersey. Um, and this can be a really useful tool for you as you're thinking about these, these rainscaping practices that I'm, you know, I'm going to talk about. If you look around this diagram, you'll see there's much more involved. Um, when it comes to stormwater than just rain gardening. I think that rain gardening are, rain gardens are um, probably the holy grail of all rainscaping features. And I really encourage you to think about um, rain gardens if you can, but not everybody can build a rain garden. Um, some people um, can replace turf and put plants in the ground, you know, basically growing gardens. Um, but you can have rain barrels, you can have cisterns, you can have um, replace that concrete sidewalk um, or that asphalt um, patio with some permeable pavers or something that allows water to go back into the ground. Um, if you are near a creek, um, you should be doing everything you can to increase the buffer area, that area where the trees and shrubs and vegetation is growing wild. That is a really important part of um, uh, keeping um, our creeks healthy. And um, uh, if you have woodlands that have honeysuckle in them, removing honeysuckle and replanting with a variety of native species is really important as well. Um, green rooftops are an option for people who live in urban places. Green rooftops um, are probably best used in places where there's no opportunity for any rainscaping practices on the ground surrounding the building. Um, it's way cheaper to build a rain garden in the ground next to a building than it is um, to put a green roof on top of a building. It requires a lot of engineering and expense. Um, it is super cool and it is something that a lot of people are doing, but, um, but it can be very expensive. So one of the ways that you can, another way that you can determine how um, rainscaping practices can fit into your 
um, property is to think about a site analysis. Now we've talked about doing site analyses here in class, um, but what really matters is understanding uh, in, in relation to rainscaping is understanding how water flows across your property. Understanding how water um, comes off of your house, goes down downspouts, and then where does the water go after it's down the downspout? Does it gather um, in any part of your yard? Does it move in, across the landscape um, to another part of um, the property or to a neighbor's property? Um, probably one of the best things to do is when it starts raining really hard, go outside and check out the rainfall. See what the water is doing as it's moving across the landscape. Now that may not be practical for um, for people who um, are doing this professionally from their office. But as a homeowner, um, if you're home and it's raining, you can grab an umbrella, step outside and start paying attention to the water flow. Um, drawing arrows to indicate where slope is, understanding where the, um, the top of the watershed is on your property. That is where the water um, starts to gather at the top of the slope and then where it goes at the bottom of the slope. And that'll inform where you can, um, where you may have a problem. It'll inform where you might be able to, to build a rain garden and probably will inform you where not to build a rain garden. We'll talk about that um, as we go through. Um, so permeable paving is something that is has been experimented um, quite a bit. Um, permeable asphalt, is, is the picture in the middle and permeable concrete to the right are two very expensive um, methods to get permeability. Um, so they're, they're expensive to install and they're expensive to maintain and they oftentimes fail because they're not maintained properly. So you can imagine all of those pores getting full of silt and grit and stuff off of cars. Um, over time, they do clog and they stop functioning. When you install it, you're, you're supposed to vacuum them out on a regular basis to pull all of, the, all of that material out of the pores, out of the pore spaces. Um, so it's expensive to maintain. Um, probably a more realistic way to attain permeable paving is by using paver systems like you see on the left here. Um, permeable pavers have spaces between them where um, fairly coarse um, trap rock material is between them where uh, it just allows water to, to go in. Um, they're usually built, constructed with a basin that has some capacity underneath it. So minimum of six, is, six inches, eight inches, 12 inches or more. Um, creates a sink where water can actually build up underground. Um, and then of course they have to overflow in, in proper locations, um, but they are great ways to create um, patios. They're really wonderful alternatives for um, sidewalks and sometimes driveways. Um, it might be expensive to do an entire driveway out of material like this, um, but, um, but they really work well for patios and sidewalks. And they don't get gummed up the way that concrete and um, asphalt do. Um, the grit can be replaced. Um, you can power wash the grit out and then replace it if it ever gets starts to get clogged. There is maintenance involved, but it's um, but it's something that actually can be um, repaired over time. Now I mentioned green rooftops. Um, green rooftops are a way to gather rainwater on top of the building. It requires special engineering to, because there's a lot of extra weight. If you can imagine um, six or eight or possibly four inches of gravel material on top of a building, that's a lot of added weight um, that has to be engineered to hold that extra um, material. And then all the water um, that gets um, uh, that that falls onto the building, and when you have plants growing up there, they tend to um, uh, absorb the the rainwater slowly over time, but it can be very very heavy, a um, lot of lot of weight involved. So they can be fairly expensive, um, 
And again, um, they make great demonstrations, but, um, but also if you have an opportunity to build a rain garden on the ground next to your building, it's far cheaper to do it that way than to put the green stuff on top of the building. Um, rainwater harvesting is something that a lot of us have been involved with. Um, so many different ways to do it. So many different scales. Um, single rain barrels um, can work to gather a certain amount of water, but you need to think about where the water goes after the rain barrel is full. And of course, you can't fill a rain barrel in the summer when it's not raining. Um, and so there are times when rain barrels are just not effective. Um, here's an, uh, an innovative um, school project here in St. Louis at um, the college school where they um, painted a bunch of otherwise kind of boring 50-gallon um, drums um, to make them colorful and interesting, link them all together with piping, and then really increase capacity. Now, this is, this is um, uh, work on a budget. Um, there are... Um, I don't have a picture of it, but there are um, some cisterns that um, that are used for this purpose, and they um, they do uh, hold a lot of water, and they are they can be fairly expensive, but they work really well. There are lots of different cistern systems. Now, thinking about um, trees in terms of stormwater um, management. Um, when trees, when it starts raining outside and you're stuck outside without an umbrella, where's the first place you go? Uh, you go and stand underneath a tree. Usually, well, that's what I do. And if I can find, you know, a really big tree, I'll go underneath that big tree first. Um, if it's an evergreen, I'll go and stand underneath the evergreen because evergreens, the leaves in the tree hold a fair amount of water at the beginning of a rain event. Um, so um, trees can go a long way to capture um, a small percentage of the rainfall that comes down. Um, so planting trees is also um, a really good option as a rainscaping practice. Um, but preserving trees that you may have already um, is important as well. Um, obviously, the root systems of trees um, pull water out of the ground, and so that, it, that has a stormwater um, capacity. Um, some trees pull more water out of the ground than others. Um, things like river birch and um, sycamore um, pull huge amounts of water out of the ground. And, um, and so it has um, an ability to, um, to deal with, with stormwater. Not everybody has an opportunity to plant a tree. Uh, not everybody has an opportunity to, um, to build a rain garden, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but a, a real practical way to deal with um, um, moving water into the soil, into the ground, is through the simple practice of replacing turf grass with garden. Um, and what happens is plants that are growing um, to their full potential, like you can see some of these perennials here that are two to three feet tall. Imagine that they have a root system that, that is perhaps two to three feet deep. And a root system that's that deep encourages water to go into the soil, um, as opposed to turf grass, which doesn't encourage water to go into the soil because when you mow turf grass three inches tall, it has a root system that's two to three inches deep which we know is not a real, um, it doesn't hold, have a lot of value in terms of encouraging water to percolate into the soil. Um, so turf grass oftentimes is, um, is an area where you see water um, flowing right over the surface, right through the turf, right downhill to wherever it's going. So turf grass doesn't work so well for stormwater. Um, another uh, way that we are, um, in encouraging people to deal with stormwater is to preserve the woodlands or the woodland pockets that we may have. Um, in our area, there is bush honeysuckle that is infesting many of our woodlands. Um, there are these monocultures of horrible bush honeysuckle that are taking over. And those woodlands or woodland pockets could be um, replaced with a variety of native plants that do a far better job of promoting wildlife, a great diversity of 
native plants equals a great amount of um, wildlife diversity. So, um, so we do really try to encourage people to address the removal of honeysuckle in our woodlands and replacing them with as many native plants as possible. Um, understory trees um, that are appropriate like pawpaw, um, understory <laughs> shrubs like some of the dogwoods and spice bush, um, and then the ground layer plants that grow um, in a woodland that are diverse, you know, grasses, sedges, flowers, like you see here. Um, some of the granzels, wild geranium, wild sweet william, wild columbine. All of these things create a diverse matrix of, of vegetation on the ground layer that helps to, prom to promote healthy, diverse woodlands that also encourage water to go into the ground. Now the Holy Grail, the rain garden, the one feature that, um, that I think can capture more rainwater than any of the features that I've mentioned so far, potentially, um, it, it involves landscapes that look more like a cup and less like um, a mound. And you know, just think about when you go into a parking lot, a conventional parking lot, and those beds are, um, they're mounded. You know, you can see that there's a slope and a cap and plants are perched up above um, the asphalt surrounding them. And um, that's the ap absolute opposite of what rain gardens do. Rain gardens do actually function as a place where water can gather. So they need to be shaped like a cup or a bowl. Um, and, but it's not intended for water to sit there. Um, the, the ideal condition for a rain garden is have it um, in a place where water still percolates into the ground. Have it positioned in a place where, um, where it's not at the bottom of the hill, but it's sort of midway from the top, between the top and the bottom. Um, those are the places that drain water the best, and those are the best places for rain gardens. Um, so rain gardens function like natural wetlands. Just think of them as a wetland that exists potentially in your yard, at your church, um, at your school, in your at your community mini mall or anywhere where you spend time. These are um, man-made structures that can go a long way toward um, capturing a lot of rainwater and preventing it from going into um, a nearby creek causing erosion and pollution problems. And um, really this is, all, this is what it's all about, is trying to reduce the, the water volume that goes over ground through pipes into nearby creeks and rivers causing lots of pollution and um, erosion problems. Um, so any reduction in stormwater is really beneficial. The point here is this tiny little rain garden um, that was connected to the single downspout. Um, a, this one house had um, four downspouts. Three of them uh, went elsewhere, but one of them off of the, um, the carport um, was uh, shunted into this small rain garden that's about 200 square feet. Um, if we each can start capturing rainwater and encouraging it to go back into the ground, um, if we each do that on a very small scale, we can start to make some really significant differences. Um, I don't know what that is. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, um, so just some points about rainscaping. My, um, let's see, can I get rid of this? Bear with me just for a sec. I don't know how to get rid of that bar at the top. Hide video under the more video panel. Oh, there's. I don't see what you're referring to, Scott. Okay, all right, I think I just got it. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you okay, good. So 
in, in our classroom, we couldn't see um, the rules of thumb for rain gardens because it was covered up and maybe you couldn't see it either, I'm not sure. Um, so rain, garden, um, rain gardens do have a series of rules that need to be paid attention to. Um, protecting soil from compaction um, is probably number one. Um, so rain gardens are never built with a skid steer or a heavy piece of equipment. They're always built um, with shovels, or if, um, if you have a mini excavator, you can reach in and grab the material without compacting um, the soil. Compaction is the last thing you want in a rain garden because you want water to move into the soil column. Oops. Um, so that I think we're gonna have to have that on the top for some reason. Um, the basin should be usually on average between four and eight inches deep. So that's the that's the cup part. That's the part that is going to hold water. Um, in general, it should be about 20 to 30 percent of the size of the impermeable that you're taking water from. So that might be a measurement of your roof. It might be a measurement of your driveway or a measurement of your patio. Um, so your rain garden is going to be about 20 to 30 percent this of the the size of the permeable, impermeable surface that you're pulling water from. Rain garden should be a distance away from your foundation. So if you have a basement, um, rain water, uh, rain gardens can actually move water toward that, that basement, toward that foundation and cause problems. So a bit, a minimum of 10 to 15 feet away from the building is really important. Um, adding sand to gardens in general is, is a very dangerous thing to do because um, sand is a major ingredient in concrete. And I've seen a lot of garden soils, or I've seen a few times, garden soils that have been ruined because of somebody adding a little bit of sand to, um, to a garden. So if you're going to do this, you have to use a ton of sand. Um, so don't, probably don't mess with putting sand in your, in your soil around your rain garden. There will be times when you want to have a rain garden near a tree. Um, so if you are near the drip line of a tree, um, you, you basically need to be careful not to disturb too many roots. You will find roots when you start digging, but if you can avoid cutting those roots as you go, um, that's only going to be beneficial to the tree that you have. Um, putting rain gardens directly under trees is, is not a great idea, although they're... Um, are tools um, that people use now to excavate soil with air um, compressor, air compression. What are those? Anybody air know spades. what this? Air spades. They're called air spades. So you can literally dig the soil out um, using an air spade, and it doesn't disturb most of the roots. And um, I have seen rain gardens built under trees using air spades. So interesting technology there that allows us to get away with. Uh, things that we used to not be able to get away with. Um, so remember, we talked about putting arrows on your um, your your um, evaluate your um, site analysis of your property, finding where those low spots are and avoiding that. You don't want to build your rain garden in the low spots. You want to find those mid flow areas. And keep in mind, if you have soil that's got a lot of clay in it, your rain garden should probably be on the large side. So instead of 20%, you should be looking at that 30% number. If your soils are very clay, that, that is that they hold a lot of water. If they are very permeable um, and they're not <coughs> too clay, then your rain garden can be smaller, like 20%. Um, grading is important. Um, build a rain garden, um, rough a rain garden basin out, and then fill it up with water and see what happens. Um, when you fill it up with water, you'll see all of your mistakes and they become evident and then you can regrade, let the water level go back down and then regrade um, and shape your, um, your rain garden basin so that it holds water. Um, there's one thing that you will want to do um, to determine whether or not you can have a rain garden and that is um, doing a good old fashioned percolation test. Dig a hole 12 inches deep, uh, fill it up with water once, let the water drain out, then fill it up with water a second time, and then measure how quickly 
the water drops in the hole. Um, and so if, you're, um, if your water is dropping at a rate of a quarter inch per hour, um, you're in good shape, a quarter inch or more per hour, then you, are ha you have pretty good percolation. You can develop a rain garden with that kind of percolation rate. If you don't have that kind of percolation rate, then go to another part of your yard and dig another hole, do another perk test and see if you get better percolation someplace else. If you do, then that's a good, a better place for your rain garden. If it doesn't work out and you can't find percolation happening anywhere in your property, then a rain garden is probably not for you. And um, so a turf alternative might be a better choice, just simply removing turf and putting garden in is gonna be um, better than having just turf grass. Uh, another alternative, you're, if your soil is not percolating very well or if it's marginally um, percolating, you can work to amend the soil. Um, you can add compost in various ways. Um, you know, Tilling is something that can destroy soil structure, but if you till gently, and not overtill, then you can actually incorporate um, compost into the soil fairly well. And then there's good old double digging with a shovel or single digging with a shovel to incorporate compost into the soil. Using augers um, to drill holes in the bottom of your rain garden, and then you can fill those holes with compost. Um, that goes a long way toward encouraging um, better soil, healthier soil that percolates water better. Um, and um, if all of that fails and you still don't get any percolation, then you really do need to find another site, uh, find another um, rainscaping practice like a turf alternative. Um, plumbing doesn't have to be complicated. Um, these materials are found in any local um, hardware store or garden center. Um, so we're talking about connectors that, um, that um, match up to a downspout um, drainage tile that's three or four inches in diameter that's sometimes run underground, um, in, as you see in this photograph here. Um, Garden, rain gardens can be fairly traditional uh, arrangements of plants um, and fit into most neighborhoods, even though you're using native plants. Um, they can look fairly conventional. Grouping plants is a, is a style that, um, that is recognizable by most people. Um, although I know a lot of people like to um, mix their plants up and have very tossed salad kinds of gardens. Remember that the plant list does not determine the design style the gardener does. So it's really how you choose to put those plants together that, um, that really makes them what they are in terms of style. Um, or you can do something that's fairly natural. Naturalistic um, gardens are more like a toss salad where plants are randomly distributed, some, somewhat allowed to um, move around freely. Um, when you have a rain garden feature, um, a rainscaping feature, um, a garden of any kind, you really wanna encourage people to use it to be there as much as possible. So pathways on um, the berms of your rain garden are uh, a good way to get into the garden, interact in the garden, benches that slow you down and get you um, to places where um, wildlife is happening. Um, those are all really important um, elements. You wanna be able to use your garden once you have it. Um, in certain situations, it's important to maintain edges um, and to create um, boundaries or borders that define the garden space. And so you can, people get really creative here. Um, sometimes um, stone walls uh, work really well, although stone can be very expensive. Um, you can get very creative and find all kinds of different ways to, um, to define the edges of rain gardens. When you have a rain garden, it's a good idea to, um, to, uh, to tell the world about it, um, to encourage people to um, uh, put a sign up, lots of different um, signs, big and small, that tell people what's going on in your garden. Um, why are we considering native plants? There are lots of reasons why native plants are important. Um, they enhance the ecological value of your property. 
um, that basically means that it, they, they're friendly to all kinds of critters that can come um, and pollinate your flowers and feed on your plants um, so that they can um, reproduce and live on your um, stems of your plants and in the ground underneath your trees. And so habitat becomes a reality when you use native plants. Um, native wetland plants are pretty remarkable um, because they can tolerate both dry and wet conditions. Um, and so rain gardens are oftentimes wet when it's raining, but they can be very dry when it's not raining, especially here in um, the Midwest. Um, so we look to natural wetlands. We look at the plants that are growing in natural wetlands to get ideas about species that can grow well in these rain garden um, settings. Um, these are all natural uh, photos from nature. And um, the, the plants that grow in these areas are the kind of plants that we typically want for, um, for rain gardens. Um, so there is something that I hear a lot uh, about. I hear a lot of people say that native plants have deep roots. There's even or organizations that are called deep roots and, um, and associated with native plants. But I, I really would tend to say that um, all plants have roots. And if plants are allowed to grow to their tallest, fullest potential, they will encourage water to move into the soil column, whether they're native or not native. Um, this um, illustration, have, you, have I showed you guys this illustration? Okay, so my class has seen this illustration. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this illustration. I don't think it's a very fair illustration because it shows mowed, tough, uh, mowed fescue grass on the far left, which is two inches deep. But if you were to let tall fescue grow on mowed, it would be maybe two or three feet tall and have a root system that's two or three feet deep. And then um, you know an old field that, um, that's not mowed will allow rainwater to move into the soil column in a way that it can't with, when you mow that grass like a turf. So, uh, so anyway, plants around the world have all different kinds of root morphologies, whether they're from North America or um, Europe or Africa or Asia or wherever, um, root morphologies are, are different um, depending on the species of plant. Native plants don't necessarily have deeper roots than anybody else's plants. Um, we, we talk about and hear about right plant, right choice. Um, just looking at um, this, you will see that some plants like growing in dry areas where there may be slopes. And on the far end of the spectrum, plants that grow submerged in water and then everything in between. Um, let's look at um, some actual plants in closing. Um, I love incorporating sedges and rushes. They work really well in rain gardens and bioswales um, because they, they're wetland plants that can tolerate both flooding and drought. And so things like yellow fox sedge or brown fox sedge or palm sedge, all are great choices for rain gardens. Um, some of the coneflowers, uh, sweet coneflower is kind of tall. It's a big plant. But orange coneflower is short and more compact and probably a better choice for smaller gardens. Um, marsh blazing stars um, tend to grow in, um, uh, in moderate soil moisture. It's called marsh blazing star, but I think it really does better in um, average soils than it does in wet soils. So put them on the slopes or put them around the edges. Um, Shining Blue Star for us in the Midwest is a rock solid performer. Um, turtle Head is another one. Um, anybody who uses Turtle Head in the garden is gonna have success because it is a great performer. Um, both of them are wetland plants that grow in um, underwater at times. And so rain gardens are underwater at times, even though they drain after um, 24 hours. Um, Couple other big plants. Um, New England aster is really a ginormous plant um, and maybe good for a large rain garden. Um, swamp milkweed um, is not quite as big, but also a big plant. Um, 
those are things that um, I think would probably not work in the teeny tiniest of rain gardens, um, but grow in bigger garden spaces. Joe pie is another one that oftentimes um, really gets big. Um, then there's a uh, lobelia and um, that's a smaller plant, something that fits in better and can tolerate some shade. Um, Monarda fistulosa is another one that tends to grow in wetland areas and it gets big. So it's one of these four foot, five foot tall plants. Smaller things that, um, that are going to be more suitable for tinier spaces. Now we, in the Midwest, we have Iris virginica. Um, I know in the East you have Iris versicolor, which is very, very similar. And then we also have copper iris, uh, which grows in the boot heel of Missouri. Uh, another amazing native plant for us in the Midwest. Uh, there's that blue lobelia growing with mist flower. Uh, bottom left, mist flower um, is, is a, a fairly aggressive plant. It does suck or it does colonize, so you're going to have to be careful about that. Um, and then um, I love this annual sneezeweed, um, Helenium autumn, uh, sorry, the, the autumn sneezeweed, Helenium autumnale, but it is a fairly big um, perennial. Uh, cardinal flower is another plant to consider. However, keep in mind that cardinal flower and blue lobelia, as you know already, my class knows that um, they're both fairly short-lived perennials and um, they will disappear pretty quickly unless you, um, either replant them or disturb the soil to encourage new seedlings to come up year after year. Um, hibiscus lasiocarpus, um, there are a number of rose mallow species. They're all fairly big, but they're all really robust and long-term performers that last a long time. They grow um, where water is um, standing also. Um, and a couple other plants, when you have a standing water situation, now rain gardens are not standing water situations, but you may have a pond, you may, you know, a pond can be a stormwater feature. Um, uh, so a few pond edge plants to consider. We have um, wild canna in our part of the lower Midwest. I'm not sure that it's hardy in New Jersey. It may not be, but pickerel weed certainly is. It's something that's quite common all throughout the Eastern US. Um, cardinal flower is a plant that, um, that can also tolerate growing at the water's edge. Um, but if you are developing a rain garden in a little bit of shade, here are some species to consider. Cardinal flower, palm sedge, um, round leaf groundsel or golden groundsel. Sorry, golden groundsel. Those are all um, some shade loving plants. Um, the ferns that love water are um, sensitive fern, ostrich fern. Um, silvery spleenwort. Um, these are species that do really well if you have a rain garden that's positioned in some shade or a lot of shade. Um, they're all going to perform really well. Uh, a few shrub ideas and small trees. Um, beautyberry is um, something that we have, um, probably not hardy in New Jersey. Uh, red buckeye is, though, um, incredibly showy blooming in spring when the hummingbirds start returning back in, um, in April. Um, and then witch hazels. Uh, witch hazels are creek bottom species. They can tolerate um, the, the harsh flooding and drought conditions that exist in the spring and then in the summer. Um, and so lastly, I wanna go through some maintenance ideas. Um, things that happen with rain gardens is that the inflow areas get clogged up and the overflow areas get clogged up. And so you need to keep those clear, um, rake out any debris or silt that may gather, um, make sure that they drain. You know, the water goes in, it should be going into the soil um, pretty quickly. That percolation test should confirm that you have good flow rates into the soil. But if it, if it backs up, that means your rain garden is somehow clogging. Um, we don't wanna use fer fertilizers or herbicides because they, they will eventually be in um, our nearby creeks because when a rain garden fills up, it does overflow eventually when the rainfall is big enough and that overflow will move any of that material straight into the, to the nearby creek. Um, 
It is important when you're getting rain gardens established to water them. And if you're interested in having a garden, uh, rain garden look good throughout the year, it's a good idea to keep them watered when it's dry outside. Um, the idea is um, to not have a bunch of dormant plants in summer. Uh, you may choose to have a bunch of dormant plants in summer when there's a drought, um, but you may not. You may choose to have plants that look really nice and green all year round, or at least through the spring, summer, and fall. Um, mulching can help get plants established. Um, weeding uh, is also something that's really important. Um, and then um, instead of cutting vegetation back in the fall or early winter, keep those stems standing through the winter months because um, there are seed that are still remaining in the seed heads and those will feed birds. Um, there's winter interest for humans. They do look really interesting. Birds are picking away at the seed heads um, and that is all really um, wonderful to see. All right, so um, Joanne, I'm going to wrap up right there. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and there you are back. Um, so um, do you, I'm going to first ask you, Joanne, do you have um, any questions that are queued up? Yeah, I have a few questions that people asked, but thank you so much for that really informative uh, lecture. It was terrific. You're um, welcome. Um, so here's some of them. One person asked, why does removing Japanese honeysuckle help with rainscaping? Uh, so why does removing Jap Japanese honeysuckle re um, help with rainscaping? Uh, it doesn't necessarily, but it was a great opportunity to talk about removing bush honeysuckle from our woodlands. Um, you know, um, having bush honeysuckle choking out our woodlands or Japanese honeysuckle, whichever species, there are a few species that are problematic, um, is really um, a problem and um, in our in our woodland environment. Um, so we have an opportunity to remove it and add greater species diversity. If you think about the root system of a single shrub like Japanese honeysuckle, which is fairly coarse and ropey. Um, there aren't a lot of roots that come off of the crown of a bush honeysuckle. Um, it doesn't have a great, uh, a really great value for holding, um, preventing erosion. But if you have a variety of other plants growing around that area, including grasses and sedges that have very fibrous roots and understory trees and shrubs that have coarser root systems, Combine those different kinds of root systems go a long way toward preventing any erosion whatsoever. Honeysuckle really can't do it alone. Okay. Um, the next question is, can you give details? Someone was very interested in that setup of all the, the rain barrels that were linked together. They were wondering if either you could give details on how to set that up or a, a link to someplace that um, would explain that. I don't have any any sources for you. I think that you probably can find, if you searched enough on the internet, how to do that. Um, the plumbing looked to me to be fairly simple, um, but I don't have any specifications to share with you, sorry. Okay, um, next one was, um, they, th this person has a swale that, um, that goes into the rain garden that gets filled up with uh, soil pretty quickly. I was wondering what advice you could give on keeping uh, rock filled swales free of sediment. If there's any tips. Well, first of all, I think that any rock filled swale or rock filled bioretention or garden should have a lot of plants in it <laughs> and not just rock. Um, so number one, rock filled basins are, um, we want to put plants in them if we can. So that might mean removing some rock to get some plants in there. Um, plants will colonize and work uh, really well to prevent erosion because that's what's happening. There is erosion happening. Soil is moving down into the system. Um, when we build rain gardens, um, uh, what you need to do in certain situations is, disc is um, you know, if you're connecting to a downspout, you don't necessarily need to run the water straight into the rain garden immediately. 
you can um, have that water bypass the rain garden for the first year or possibly the first two years until all of the plants get established. And then once those plants get established, then you can connect the water into the rain garden. So I see that usually siltation happens in the early phases of construction or when you're building something in the first few months, there's a lot of vulnerability because um, the plants haven't filled out their root systems. They haven't um, gotten big enough to cover the ground um, fully. So usually it's in the early phase when there's a problem. Um, but plants can, once they get established, do a really great job of preventing erosion. Now, would you would you put those plants that are in the um, rock filled area right in uh, the swale or at the, the edges or at the top of it? Where, how would you situate or all along the whole swale? So where would you put the plants in a rock filled swale? And I would say, put them everywhere. <laughs> um, so we, I just um, turned a rock filled swale into a, um, into, a, into a channel where water can actually move through um, when there's a lot of rain. Um, and what we did was instead of lifting all of the rock and removing it all, we, every three feet we removed a three foot section. So we removed a three foot section of, gra of rock and then planted in that three foot section. We left three feet of gravel. And then um, and then after that, we took another section of gravel out and planted plants. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it, you may have to pull cobble or rock or gravel or whatever it is out here and there to get down to the soil. But I really would encourage um, planting iris, planting palm sedge, getting um, orange cone flower down into those areas and they will um, grow out and replace the gravel or the cobble. And speaking of iris, uh, someone asked, is iris fulva native in New Jersey? I don't know if you'd know the answer to that. or maybe I don't think that iris fulva is palm. native to New Jersey. <laughs> it's native. It's a pretty rare plant in the lower Midwest. Um, it's in um, the boot hill of Missouri. It's in um, Eastern Arkansas, Western Tennessee, Western Northwestern Mississippi. I guess the Iris versicola would be the substitute uh, in this area. Yeah, Iris versicolor in the east. Iris, uh, no, Iris versicolor is ours. Iris virginica. No, wait, which no, one's ours? <laughs> Virginica's are ours. Versicolor is yours. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, and I'm just reading, uh, oh, what are the pros and cons of dry stream beds? Well, I just described a dry stream bed um, that's full of gravel. Um, the con is that um, it can silt in. The con is that there's no plants in it. So there's no ability for water to, to move into the soil column. Um, the, the con is that water just moves across it the same way it moves across concrete or moves across uh, lawn, mowed lawn. And so we really want to try to encourage water to move into the ground. So any opportunity you can to incorporate plant material, um, it, it grows roots into the soil and those roots become avenues where water literally goes into the ground. And so there's not much good about dry stream beds um, unless they have a bunch of plants growing in them. Okay. And uh, the next question was, uh, besides compost, what else can we add to the soil to improve permeability? I know you spoke about different uh, mechanical techniques, but is there anything else you can add? Um, I think that good old compost is probably the best thing that to be adding into um, your soil because compost has mycorrhizae in it. Compost has lots of organic matter. It has nutrients in it. Um, and, um, and it really goes a long way toward breaking up clay that does not drain very well. Um, so good old compost, yeah, if compost. it's fully composted now, don't ever put any mulch in there or any partially composted material. That's just going to kill plants. Gotcha. And last question. Any questions um, out here? I just have one more. Uh, uh, the, you mentioned a website at the beginning of the presentation about the rain garden manual. Um, could you repeat that? I think it was the mobot.org slash rainscaping. Was that? Um... 
Uh, yes. So it's the Native Landscaping Manual, Chapter 2, uh, which is available at either at Missouri Botanical Garden at their website or at Shaw Nature Reserve, which is a, a division of Missouri Botanical Garden, Shaw Nature Reserve with an R. And if you go to their website and go look up gardens and gardening, you can pretty easily find um, a list of resources in the rainscape. Uh, the rainscaping guide chapter two is listed in there as a downloadable PDF. Excellent. Okay, well, that's right. all the questions we've had. Do we have any questions in our audience here? Yeah, in the back. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, um, it, are there the same kind of question, are, are there other things that you would consider using other than compost to amend soils, like turfus? And so turfus is a great amendment to soil. You need to work it into the upper layer of topsoil um, to, to, you know, engage it to get it um, to start to work. Gypsum is another material that is oftentimes incorporated into clay to break it down if it's really not draining very well or if it's heavily compacted. Um, so yeah, both of those are, are definitely used in the trade. I see it, I see turfus being mixed in with soil quite often. Turfus, for those of you who don't know, is um, it's kind of like a Kitty litter product is a baked clay product. Um, it has really great water holding capacity, but it also has really great um, drainage ability. It increases drainage really well. It's used in ball fields a lot. Hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. So the question was, um, is there, just the right, is there a sweet spot for the amount of rainfall that we get? Um, and so to answer your question, I'm gonna say that, remember that target of 20 to 30% of the impermeable surface. So the rain garden that you're creating should be about 20 or 30% of the, of the surface that you're trying to capture. Um, that rain garden that's maybe four to eight inches deep is going to, catch about a one inch rainfall or less. And so if you have 1.5 inches of rain, then it's gonna start spilling over the rain garden and it's gonna to go to wherever you design your rain garden to have it go. Um, so most of these rain gardens that I'm talking about do have a capacity for about one inch. Now, not every rainfall event is one inch or less, of course, we get two inch rains, three inch rains, sometimes more. Um, so it is really important to make sure that the overflow for your rain garden isn't pointed toward your neighbor's basement. <laughs> it's important for your rain garden to overflow either into a creek next door in the back or to um, the in urban places into an alley where there is there are storm drains or to the front of the property where the street has storm drains, because those are all acceptable places for overflow to happen. You wanna make sure that your overflow doesn't move toward your house. Um, and so thinking about where water goes after it fills up your rain garden and then spills over is really important. Question. All right, any other questions from you, Joanne? No, I think that was it, that was it, I don't see Okay, anything. well, Thank you so much. We um, we you. did Thank did you. that in just about one hour. How about that for timing? Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. I'm going to say goodbye and um, everybody have a great evening and happy gardening. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks very much. We're gonna we're gonna end the session now. Good night, everybody.